All right, that's the title of my sermon. I will give you the heads up. It's going to be a long one. It's just uh, buckle into your seat. It'll be a long one. I've got a lot of scriptures to go through because there's a lot in the Bible about the topic of wine. So it's going to be a long sermon, but I'm sure you'll find it interesting. It is a very, it's going to be a very interesting sermon. So um, just, uh, just a heads up. Now, there is a question in the Bible. Uh, is it a sin to drink alcohol? Is it a sin to drink alcohol? So Christians argue over this topic. Uh, my position is, I do not believe it is a sin to drink a beverage that contains alcohol. Now, I understand in conservative circles that can be a, uh, a controversial position to take, but I believe it's the biblical position, and I'll explain in this sermon. Now, I want to be clear, that doesn't mean I condone drunkenness, right? Because drunkenness is a sin. So you have to understand when it comes to things of doubtful disputation, where there is a gray area between what is right and wrong, because it's based on our own conviction rather than clear scriptures in the Bible, you can understand why people are always accusatory of people that have a you know, a, a less strong conviction than somebody who takes a more strict conviction. So think about other things of, of doubtful disputation, where just because you allow something, people accuse you of excess. So you might say, well, I don't have a problem. I don't think it's a sin for a man to have long hair, even though I discourage it, right? I don't think, it's, I don't think men should have long hair, but I don't think it's a sin for a man to have long hair. And somebody might say, oh, you just want men to look like women. You just want men to have long hair everywhere. No, that's not. Just because you don't think it's a sin doesn't mean you condone it in excess. It's the same when you say, well, I don't think it's a sin for a woman to wear pants. Does that mean I just want women to, to look like men wherever they go? I want them to build up muscles. I want them to be like a man. No. So just because you allow something does not mean that you condone it in excess. It's, just, it's no different to allowing yourself to have a sweet drink or allowing yourself to have some candy. doesn't mean you condone gluttony or allowing yourself to have some pleasure in this life. Right? We have some pleasure. We have blow off some steam. We have some fun. Does that mean you ought to live a lifestyle that's characterized just by pleasure and that's all you do? No. So just because it isn't a sin, that doesn't mean you just say it in excess. Like saying pleasure is okay isn't a call to hedonism. Saying you have to work hard and make a living doesn't mean you ought to be covetous and you ought to just only think about money, only think about your work. So to be clear, I'm not promoting drunkenness. I believe drunkenness is a sin. Nor am I even saying everybody should drink like things with, that contain alcohol. So I'm not saying like, hey, you, you ought to drink things with alcohol. I just think this is a conviction people can have. They can decide whether or not and the amount that they drink as long as they don't get drunk. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying there is an amount of alcohol that can be consumed that does not cause drunkenness. That's what I'm saying. And as long as it's that amount, then you're not in sin. Now, some people take issue with a person's convictions promoting a certain behavior, right? So you might say, oh, yeah, well, if you say, you know, women can wear pants, and then you're going to promote immodesty. You're going to promote this, you're going to promote that. So I get that. I get that not everyone is comfortable with another person's convictions, right? You may not like somebody's convictions promoting a certain behavior that you, your convictions do not want to encourage. So I understand that. But in the same way, I don't like a person's convictions condemning a certain behavior when it ought not be condemned, right? And people will like rail on people and things like that and call them drunkards when they're not. See, that's what I don't like, especially when they're inconsistent, right? And especially when it, I don't think it's the best explanation of Scripture, right? When people are inconsistent, when they themselves will admit to consuming beverages with alcohol in them, then I have a real, I have a problem with people being inconsistent with their own convictions, right? I'm not saying that they're necessarily in sin, but I mean, according to themselves, they should be in sin according to their own conscience, but for some reason, they don't see themselves as that. 
So I think it's important that issues like this are, are recognised as issues of convictions, as issues of conscience. And then what you then decide to do from then on in your own life is up to you. All right? So there's two positions on wine in the Bible. There's two, there's two positions, right? Now, one position is complete abstinence. One position says that alcohol is a poison, should not be consumed at all. You know, it's like, it's like haram. <laughs> is, that, is that what Muslims call it? It's like, it's, it's like something we, sh we shouldn't even have, right, at all. A complete abstinence. So how they will explain verses in the Bible, right, wine, they'll say positive mentions of, uh, positive mentions, or like positive verses. So like a verse where it speaks positively about wine in the Bible, it's always non-alcoholic wine, 0%, because complete abstinence, right? Negative verses, so negative mentions of wine in the Bible, are always alcoholic, so whatever percentage and up, right? Because it's, so once, it's, once it's fermented, it, you shouldn't be drinking at all. That's, that's one position, which is abstinence. Second position is my position, which is what I believe, is moderation, right? So the way you would explain, the way we would explain the verses, if we would say positive verses of wine in the Bible can be either alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Because, you know, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have to be that every mention of wine has to be alcoholic. I, I, can, I can accept, all right, th there are ways people can preserve it or you drink it freshly squeezed and if it doesn't have any alcohol. I don't have a problem with that, right? It's like, okay, th that can be positive too. It's when you rule out the fact that the positive ver ver verses can also be applied to alcoholic as well. And that's what I'm going to show you in this sermon today. But, and the negative verses. So here, the negative verses were, it's just applying to alcohol, full stop, abstinence. But what we would say in terms of the moderation position is negative verses of wine in the Bible refers to the excess consumption of alcohol. All right, so those are the two positions that are there. Now, when it comes to complete abstinence. I personally believe it's inadequate. There's an ina it's an inadequate explanation of all verses and I hope to sort of show that as I go through the sermon. But what are some implications of abstinence? What do I mean by implications? If you take this position, what does that mean in a practical sense? What would that mean in your life? Well, one is ignorant con consumption is still a sin. Right? Because if you consume something, if you sin ignorantly, it's not that you're not sinning, you just don't know that you're sinning. So if you're consuming something that has alcohol, you just don't know it had alcohol, that doesn't absolve you of sin. You're still sinning if it's a sin to consume alcohol. So ignorant consumption would still be a sin. I remember, uh, I'll tell you a story, because I, it, was, it was when I was over in Phoenix. I remember, um, because I, there's people I know over there that have this position where it's complete abstinence. And we're at an expo. And um, it, was like a health, it was like a health conference or something. It's, but somebody was making, they, they, you know, now they make like non-alcoholic beer. They make like non-alcoholic wine and things like that. So I think they were giving out taste testers. So they, they took a few of those taste testers, oh, you know, non-alcoholic beer. But then they accidentally took some of the taste testers as well that had alcohol in it. So they were jo joking about afterwards, oh, you know, like, well, so we, we took some taste testers and some of them had alcohol. So yeah. But then, like, the preacher of the church I was at was there. We were so angry with them, like, you know, because it's like, that's sin, right? So, anyway, this is, this is how people, if, if, at least they're consistent with what they believe, right? That's consistent. Even if you did it by accident, that doesn't mean you did right. You're still in sin. What else does it mean? It also means medicinal use is sin. If it's a sin to consume alcohol, you can't say, well, but, but if it's for a medicine, it's okay to consume because now you're admitting it's not a sin anymore. Now, you, now you're admitting that it's just a conviction that you have, that if you are drinking it for pleasure, I allow it. But if you're, drink, oh, no, if you're drinking for pleasure, I don't allow it. But if you're drinking for medical reasons, then I do allow it. So if they're not the arbiter of sin and not sin. That's now a conviction. That's now their own, their own what they allow, what they do not allow, are being applied to alcohol. Because if it was a sin to consume it, full stop, then... You wouldn't even be able to consume it in something like cough syrup, right? If you didn't know, there's, there's a cough syrup called Benadryl, and that has 5% alcohol in it. And a lot of cough, the reason why cough syrups have alcohol in them, not because the alcohol necessarily does anything, it's mainly because they use it as a solvent. 
And so a solvent, if you don't know, I'm sorry, getting a bit of <laughs> track here. A solvent is when you need to dissolve something in it. So you have like sol solvents. So because some of the things don't dissolve well in water, they use alcohol to, to, to mix it into the cough syrup. Um, that's what I read anyway. But you can see like if you take that position, that's like similar to like a JW, why they don't do blood transfusions because they don't believe it's right to consume blood. They will not even do it even in, when it comes to blood transfusions. So they're at least consistent with that view. But if somebody says, hey, it's a sin to consume alcohol, yeah, they can consume it here, they can consume it there, oh, it's all right here, it's all right there, it's all right here. Well, then you're not really believing it's a sin anymore. You just have a conviction about it. What are some other implications? What about healthy fermented foods and drink? Right? So there are, so there are health drinks out there, like kefir, kombucha, things like that, that are actually healthy for your gut, that are recognized as good for your gut. But yet you should not consume these if you believe uh, in total abstinence of alcohol. Now, you, you know, I don't know if you know this as well, but you know, ripe fruit, when fruits are ripe, they contain a little bit of alcohol too, trace amounts of alcohol. You say, well, I, that's not a sin because, you know, because you're eating it, you're not drinking it. Yeah, well, what if somebody blends up? What if you make like a banana smoothie with ripened bananas? You know, they have like a bit of alcohol in there. Are you making an alcoholic beverage now? So, you know, I know it sounds silly, but but these are the sort of things you've got to ask to think, is this position consistent? Can I even live by the standard that I believe I'm setting? And then there's the question of, well, do the verses even teach that? Now, the second one, obviously, is what I'm going to spend most of my time on. Now, there is a, there is a, there is a third position, which is not really a third position, but people think it's a third position. Is, and this third position is that you preach this one, you preach abstinence, but what you actually practice is moderation, right? And that's why I'm saying this is, a, this is a little bit inconsistent, it's a little bit hypocritical. Because if you preach abstinence, but you admit that you consume alcohol, in any amount of alcohol, then you've already admitted that it's not about the actual consumption of alcohol, it's, about a, it's the amount of alcohol that you're consuming, or it's the situation in which you're consuming that alcohol. So therefore, it's not a sin anymore. It's about conviction. So you're not even believing your own position. So the way they would phrase, instead of, see, the way I phrase my position is it's moderate consumption versus excess consumption. That's, that's okay versus not okay, right? But the way this third position seems to be framed is, it is a beverage with a lower percentage of alcohol, that's okay, versus a beverage with a higher percentage of alcohol. Right? That's sort of how they're phrasing it. But then my question is, if you have lower alcoholic beverages and you have higher alcoholic beverages, well then where is the line? Like where's the line between when it becomes sinful and when it's okay? And when you say, well, the line is there somewhere, obviously there's a line. But if you have a line somewhere on here that you can't define from a Bible verse, then that's a conviction, my friend. You can't say like, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's sin when you're the one setting the line. Because think about this. They'll say, well, wine, that's their upper limit. You know, that, that's a sinful drink. But then the people that allow low alcoholic drinks, they'll say, but kombucha is okay. Kombucha is fine, which has 0.5% alcohol, up to 0.5% alcohol, ones you buy in the shops, right? 0 0.5. Now let me ask you, like, wh like why, why is that the limit? Why is that the lower, why is that one okay and that one's not okay? Who decided? See, this is how I can show, this is why it's a conviction, because it's not defined in the Bible, the percentage of alcohol that makes it okay. If your position is low alcoholic, it's okay to drink things with low alcohol, but it's not okay to drink things with high alcohol. Who decided that that's, that, that becomes bad and that's okay? Why isn't, why isn't light beer the lower limit? Why isn't 2.7% okay? But no, if you drink a light beer, if you drink a little bit of light beer, you are a drunkard, a wine bibber, but that one's okay. That one's not okay. But why, why, isn't that, why, isn't, why isn't the limit there? Why isn't that end down okay and that one up not okay? You see how it's what Bible verse are they using to define these upper and lower limits? I get there's a line. I'm not saying there's no line. What I'm saying is that line is determined by conviction. It's not determined by clear scripture. 
Why isn't the upper limit this? Why, why, why isn't this one's okay? Why isn't that defined as a low alcoholic drink? And that one defined as the high alcoholic drink? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, so where along the line does this work? And did you know most people make kombucha at home? And I don't know if you know this, but kombucha, kombucha manufacturers, and you can read about this on their websites, kombucha manufacturers actually have to remove some of the alcohol from kombucha. And the reason is, is because in Australia and in most countries, if your alcohol level goes above 0.5%, then it has to be classified and sold as an alcoholic beverage. So that's why, to keep it a health drink, they need to sometimes remove some of the alcohol and test it to make sure their alcohol level is always below 0.5%. But if you brew kombucha at home, which most people do, because stuff can be expensive if you're drinking every day, so most people, they brew it at home themselves, they make their own kombucha. And homemade kombucha normally has about 1 to 2% alcohol. Right? Because you don't remove the excess alcohol, you may just like, oh, I'll just put in some sugar, just make it. So you, you, and you may ferment it longer than they ferment. They have it under control because they have to you know, follow regulations that the government sets. Now, this is why it's silly to say low alcoholic versus high alcoholic, and that's how you determine right and wrong. Um, and, and, not, and not recognize that it's a conviction. Because they'll say, oh, why, why don't they think that this one is sinful? This one? Because they'll say, well, it's because you can drink as much of this one as you want, and you'll never feel the effects of alcohol, which is, which is not true. You know, like if you drink enough of this, you'll start to feel it. You'll, you'll get a bit of a buzz if you, you drink enough of this 1% to 2% homemade kombucha, just like if you drank enough of this. So number one, that's not even true, right? But then they say like, well, you, you can drink, they say like, well, you can drink tons of this stuff and you won't feel it. But this one, if you drink this, this is capable of getting you drunk. Well, here's the secret, guys. Here's how you, here's how you make it work. Right? This, is, this is mind blowing. This may be mind blowing to you, but this is how you make it work. You just drink less of this. Right? Like, yeah, like, yeah, I get, you can drink as much of this as you want, you may not feel it, but that doesn't mean you just have to gorge yourself on high alcoholic drinks. I mean, you could just drink less and then you've consumed the same amount of alcohol as a low alcoholic drink. And this is what's silly because if you take the view that a low alcoholic beverage in terms of the percentage of alcohol in the drink is okay, but a higher percentage of alcohol in the drink is not okay, then that means technically you could consume a greater total volume of alcohol in a low alcoholic drink then drinking less of a high alcoholic drink and somehow you're not in sin. Let me give you an example. Right? Let's compare homemade kombucha. And I'll be, I'll be getting into the scriptures soon. I'm just sort of setting the different positions. So when we go through the positions, you'll understand um, the verses. So let's compare homemade kombucha with your standard wine. So this is like, you know, say 1% alcohol, you make kombucha at home. And wine... They say on average, standard glass, 13.5%. So that's the alcohol percentage. Now let's say in a week, let's say you're on the kombucha bandwagon, right? You're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm still gonna be drinking this daily, my health. So let's say every day you drank seven 250 ml portions. Now some people drink more than that every day. But let's say every day you drank, because you know, they, they say the recommended dose of kombucha is like three 150 ml portions a day. So 450 ml every day but let's say 250 ml just for this example. And, but in this example, let's say somebody doesn't drink kombucha, they just enjoy a glass of red wine every week on the weekend. Right? Just one glass, standard glass of wine, 100 ml, 13.5%. These are the government's figures, right, where they classify standard glass of wine. So I think your regular restaurant serving is 150 ml, but let's say 100 ml. But let's say somebody said even they may not even want to drink a whole standard. They just want to have 50 mils just to enjoy with their dinner. What's the total alcohol? Well, if you multiply 250 mil by 1% times 7, you get to 17.5 mil. But the wine, you've only consumed 13.5 mil. So are you telling me that if somebody consumes kombucha every day over a week, they are not in sin? But if somebody consumes a glass of wine once a week, they are a drunkard. They are a wine bibber. 
You know, they ought not even, even really be part of the church, right? Because a drunkard's not meant to be part of the church. So, but they're consuming less alcohol than this guy in a week. You see how, like, it, it starts to fall apart when you... Because really, what's the difference? You know, if I, so if I drink 20 mils of wine straight, I'm a drunkard, I'm a wine bibber. But if I dilute it in water, then drink it, now I'm no longer a sinner? You know, just because the alcohol percentage has come down so you see how it's not being consistent you know what makes one substance worse than another is it is it the intent they may say well it's because the people that make this stuff they make it to get drunk but just because they make it to get drunk does that mean you must drink it to get drunk you know somebody might make something for an intention and if you don't you know you don't necessarily have to do that, right? Or is it, is it based on the intent of the consumer? What do I mean by that? Let's say, let's say, well, yeah, but people buy that to get drunk. Yeah, but the creator of it may not have made it for you to use it that way. You know, are we going to ban knives? Because people make knives for you to cook and then you go out and murder someone. You use it for the purpose it's not intended. So it's the same with alcohol, just because they made it for another point, and you then go and abuse it by getting drunk, does that, does that make it wrong to create? No, you say like, oh, well, you say, well, what reason is there for somebody to make alcohol besides to get drunk? I don't know, taste? Maybe they just like how it tastes? You know, maybe they like, maybe it's good for their health, like kombucha. You know, so it's like, uh, there are other reasons. Why. What if it's just a more economical way of preserving their harvest? You know, because you can say, well, they can preserve it by boiling it down to a concentrate and re-watering it. But, you know, that, that takes more, more finances, right? Because you, now you've got to use all the fuel to boil it down and then you've got to add water back to it. You know, maybe you just preserve it because it's cheaper to preserve. There's already a natural way that it's preserving itself. So a line that exists for you but can't be proven by Scripture, it, that's what's called a conviction. Um, so it's no longer about objective right and wrong. It's about what I allow or do not allow or what I encourage or discourage. So you're allowing certain drinks and not others just due to their alcohol content. So I want to go through some scriptures now and just explain them to you in light of these two positions. So I'll, I'll say here's a scripture. This is how number one would understand it. Here's how we would understand it. And then you can see what you think. Obviously, I have a bias because that's my view. But you can see for yourself... I'll try and be as unbiased as possible in terms of the, the way it's presented. Because there's two questions we need to answer. One is, do the negative passages in the Bible, so the verses that are negative for wine, do they teach complete abstinence or are they teaching not the excess consumption of alcohol? That's one question to ask when you read a negative verse. Or if you read a positive verse, the second question do the positive passages in the Bible concerning wine apply to only non-alcoholic wine? Or do we have positive mentions in the Bible that cannot be understood unless it's alcoholic wine? Right? Because those two questions, if we answer, will determine what position is more reasonable. So let's first look at negative verses. And I'll try and get through these as quick as I can. Um, negative verses. Now the first one we'll go to is where we started, right? Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? Um, I just noticed this one while reading it today, but um, it answered a question for me that I have later on. So just keep, keep an eye on that one, right? So who has wounds without cause? Redness of eyes, right? It's something to do with somebody that's drinking too much wine. Um, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his colour in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Um, and then it talks about, you know, being unbalanced and stuff and then wanting to seek it again. Now how would somebody that believes in position one understand this verse? They would say, well, this is warning us of the dangers of alcohol. And this is why you should not even, you should have nothing to do with it. They will say, they will even go to the point and say, some people are so strict, they'll say, you should not even look at it. Don't even look at it. 
Now, that, I think some people who have taken the abstinence view have realized they can't interpret the verse that way because if they do, this is, if they do, this is where you get the belief that when you walk down coals, like you should, like when you walk past liquor land, you should be like, you know, you don't go down the, the wine aisle. You know, when you're at Costco and you're at the checkouts, you're just going to be like, this is the wine section over there. That's what, that's, that's, that, uh, you may laugh, but that's what they do. And but then you ask the question, well, if they're bringing like wine to the tabernacle and to the temple to, to pour out an offering, like what, what are they doing? Are they not looking at it when they pour it out? Um, and then you've got people like, I think in the States, they make like coverings for the bottles of wine so they can have it, but they're not looking at it. You know, and it's, there are things like that that occur. And, um, you know, that, that's just them being consistent. I know if you don't take that view, you can't find it humorous. But for somebody that takes that view, they will go to those measures to obey scripture. So I respect them for that. But they will have a problem because obviously if you can't even look at it, then there are other problems in other verses, right? So, so they'll say, well, what this, all this is saying is just like don't, don't have anything to do with it. It's not that you can't actually look at it physically. It's just saying, look, that's the verse that's telling you don't even drink it at all, right? You shouldn't be looking at it. Just stay away from it. That's how they would understand Proverbs 23. Now, how would somebody of position 2 understand Proverbs 23? Well, they will say, well, obviously, this is, this is a passage that is not talking about consuming alcohol moderately. This is a passage that, you know, if this person is tarrying long at the wine, they go to seek mixed wine. This is somebody that's already addicted to this substance. And, and he's saying, hey, this, this is what happens to people, right? And there are people like this. But then when it gets to look not thou upon the wine, it's not saying nobody anywhere can ever look at wine or have anything to do with wine. We would understand it and say, well, it's, it's this person that is struggling with this that should not look at it, right? So this person that is tarrying along at the wine, going to seek mixed wine, they should not even look at wine because wine will have that allure for them. And it's like that. For people that struggle with alcohol, they ought not have wine around the house. They ought not, you know, go down the wine aisle. They should... That, that's wisdom there, if they're struggling with it. But you can see that this person is actually addicted to it because it gets to the end. And again here, verse 32, at the last it biteth like an adder. Not at the first it biteth like an adder. At the last. And then these are things people do when they're drunk, right? Not when they're just consuming it and they're not drunk. But you can see here it's talking about somebody that is, that is addicted. Because look, even though... He's saying, like, I feel like I've been beaten. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm sick and everything, and, I, and they haven't, they've beaten me, yet he seeks it again. So you see that that's somebody that cannot control themselves, right? They, they're given to wine. So that's how we would understand Proverbs 23. I'm not saying that position one doesn't make sense. I'm just saying, hey, this is how people will interpret different passages based on what they believe. But I think when you look at all scripture, uh, you'll, it'll start to paint a different picture. Now, obviously, drunkenness is a sin in the Bible. So nobody's disputing the fact that drunkenness is a sin. The question is, is Proverbs 23, is it condemning drunkenness, which is what I think, and which is quite clear in the passage, or is it condemning the moderate consumption? And I think, you know, if people take the extreme view that you can't even physically look at alcohol, it's hard to defend that. Now, look at Isaiah 5. This is drunkenness. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night. See, so this is not somebody that's moderately consuming. So what is it condemning? Hey, somebody that drinks from morning till night. Some people do that. They just, they just always have a beer with them, whatever. They're just always drinking. That's the sort of person that ought not to even look at it. Right? They're a drunkard. Till wine inflame them. You see, so wine can overcome you. The first mention of somebody getting drunk in the Bible was Noah, Genesis 9. And it says here, Noah began to be an husband and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. So the position one person would say, yeah, see, he drank a little bit of wine. But you know, this fits position two too because you can say, well, he's, he's doing wrong because he, he, had, he consumed too much alcohol. It wasn't that he just consumed a little bit of his, of his wine from his vineyard. Ephesians 5, and I'm going to try and go to every verse that I know. I, I'm not going to absolutely every verse because it will get a little bit repetitive, but the, the arguments that I've heard I'm trying to address. Ephesians 5, this is another one where people will use this verse to say you should not drink alcohol at all. Is that what it's actually saying? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, 
but be filled with the Spirit. So they'll say, you know, well, the way they would interpret is, well, you know, how much of the, you know, if you drink, you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. So therefore, you should drink as little as possible and be filled with the Spirit as much as possible. But notice here, it's not saying don't drink wine. It's saying be not drunk with wine. So it's not that, that deep, this verse debunks position two. Position two can, can accept this verse no problem because it's like, yeah, it's telling me not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess, too much, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is where I think people, and like, uh, this is what I've been thinking about, like this verse. This is, I think, people un misunderstand what this verse is actually saying. See, people, people think the way alcohol and the spirit of god work it's like it's like you know like imagine like 100 percent, and then you've got like a portion of god's spirit and you've got a portion of alcohol and it's like the more alcohol you drink the less you'll be filled with the spirit right and the more you're filled with the spirit the less alcohol you drink so they make the case well you want to be completely because we should we should strive to be completely filled with the spirit so therefore any amount of alcohol you drink is going to make you not completely filled with the spirit because it's going to be pushing that that balance the other way. That's how they sort of interpret this verse on how it's working. And they say that's why you should be complete abstinence. But is that, is that what this is saying? Is that how it works, that these are opposing forces that are pushing each other? Or is it saying the way wine works is when you are consumed with it, it overtakes sobriety. Right? You are, so the, 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 the force is not actually the spirit of God. It is sobriety versus drunkenness right or you know what to the point where it overcomes sobriety right because we're saying well you can consume a little bit of alcohol and still be sober but there's a point where when you're filled with wine it overcomes and you're no longer sober so he's saying that's what wine does when it's had in excess so he's saying in the same way you want you don't want to be filled with wine and overcome sobriety you actually want to be filled with the spirit and overcome the flesh right so it's not that wine and the spirit are opposing forces it is the opposing force well what's putting you over the barrier is you like like you like you don't want to be filled with wine so wine overtakes you and then and then you're no longer sober what it's saying is like the way wine works but you want it to be with the spirit Right? You want it to be with the Spirit of God to overtake you so that overcomes you and you're filled with the Spirit of God. So that's why I say, hey, don't be drunk with wine because that's excess. But if you think about it this way, but be filled with the Spirit. What is he saying? Be drunk with the Spirit of God because that's not excess. That's good. That's actually right to be excessively filled with the Holy Spirit. So I think that's why people can use that verse to sort of say hey, total abstinence. But I think if you understand it that way, which is what I think it's actually teaching, it's saying, hey, like the way wine works, the spirit works like that too, can overcome. And therefore, you should be filled with it. And don't be filled with something wrong. Um, now, First Peter 4. Now, people will say here, well, wherein is excess doesn't mean drinking too much. Because if you compare it with First Peter 4, you'll see here that it's mentioning excess of wine. But then in verse 4 as well, it says excess of riot. So excess doesn't necessarily mean just excess consumption, like too much. It just means any consumption at all because they'll say, well, it's not right to riot, is it? So why would, why would excess of riot mean you can have a little bit of riot but not excess of riot? Now, I don't agree with that because like we talked about with pleasure, right? See here when it's condemning certain things, these things aren't wrong necessarily in moderation. Like banquetings. Is, is having a banquet sinful? It's not sinful. But what is this verse talking about when it's condemning this lifestyle of the Gentiles? It's excessive banqueting. But it's, ex it's, it's when it's, there's nothing wrong, like a banquet can be excessive. But excessive banqueting is when you're banqueting all the time. That's excessive banqueting. So it's not wrong to do something necessarily and celebrate and have excess of food and drink and things like that. There's time and place for that. But it's saying, hey, this shouldn't be all the time, right? So it's the same with this. You could put that into the same category because it's not necessarily wrong to have, what is riot? Riot is to have some pleasure, right? That's why here in Luke 15, when it talks about the prodigal son leaving 
And he says he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. What was the riotous living? It's like luxurious, pleasurous living. But the thing is, it's not wrong to have a little bit of pleasure. So you see, so that's why it's not, this is not condemning pleasure. This is just saying your lifestyle should be not excess pleasure, which is, makes sense. And likewise here, it's not excess of wine. So I think you can maintain the meaning of excess in Ephesians 5 to say, well, drunk with wine is the excess consumption of alcohol. Now let's go on to Proverbs 20. So you see, we recognize that there is a danger associated with the excess consumption of alcohol. So when you look at a verse like Proverbs 20, it says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Well, what would position one say? Position one will say, well, the fact that you drink it at all, you're already deceived by it. But if there's no danger in drinking a little bit, the danger is in drinking excess, well, what position two would say, well, when you're deceived by it is when you don't recognize the dangerous effects, right? When you think, oh, yeah, I can drink however, when somebody says I can drink however much I want and I'll be fine, that's somebody who is deceived by alcohol. But somebody that knows, hey, I shouldn't be drinking too much and that's why I limit my consumption, they're not deceived by it, right? So there's two ways that people understand Proverbs 20 as well. Let's go on to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. <laughs> Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So I'm touching on the verses, first of all, where people try and teach a total abstinence of alcohol. And I think when you apply consistently throughout the passage, it doesn't hold up. Now look what it says here in verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto them, unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now, how would, how would the position one understand Proverbs 31? They would say, well, God has made us kings and priests. The Bible's saying here, it's not for kings and priests, right? It's not king for kings and princes to drink alcohol. So therefore, you shouldn't drink any at all, because so you're a king, right? You're a priest. But why, why do I think that that's not an adequate explanation of this verse? One is, well, if, if this is teaching complete abstinence, that it's a sin to give somebody, to drink alcohol, why then in verse 6 is it all of a sudden okay to give it to somebody else? So they say, well, they say, oh yeah, well, because this is like the loser, this is like the drunkard, the derelict, the, the people in society that probably need our help. <laughs> give it to them. You know, they can just waste themselves away and get drunk and, you know, they're alone. What, what are they, you know, it's like God, it's, it's like having the Jonah, the, you know, the Jonah attitude, like, ah, you know, these guys, just let them die, you know. Is that the attitude of this verse? That, hey, it's not for my, my people, but, you know, for the one that's like the loser in the gutter, the one that's struggling about it, just give it to them. Let them waste away. And let their misery, let them remember their misery. But even so, if it's a sin to drink alcohol, to consume alcohol, would it be okay to give it to somebody else? And of course not. No, it's, it's like, it's, if it's wrong for me to murder, it's not okay for somebody else to murder. It's not okay for me to encourage somebody else to murder. If it's wrong to sin, if it's wrong to drink wine, why would it be okay to give it to somebody else to then get drunk, right? Especially if, like, you know, that, that's... So, obviously, this is saying it's not necessarily wrong, but then how do we understand this? So, wh how do we understand this passage? I'll give you some thoughts here. First of all, I, I think there are uh, evidences that this, it's not for kings and not for, uh, for princes, is the fact of being given to it. Because he starts verse 3 saying, Give not thy strength unto women. Now, is it wrong to sleep with a woman? Well, no, because in the confines of marriage, there is a way that it's okay. That's not that that act in and of itself is wrong. Right? So you, when you're married, you're not giving yourself unto women. So similarly, if you drink a little bit of alcohol, you have not given yourself to alcohol. So I think there's a hint there that that's what he's talking about, right? Giving yourself unto these ways that destroy kings, which is women and having too much alcohol. So this is where he says here, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. I'll come back to that one in a moment. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine 
unto those that be of heavy hearts. I'll just touch on verse 6 first. So what do I think this verse is teaching is there is, there is t a time and place where you should not consume alcohol. Right? There are certain situations where alcohol should not be consumed. And there are certain situations where alcohol consumption is, is encouraged. Right? So one is when somebody is like ready to perish, and, and oftentimes alcohol has been used as palliative care. Right? Cheer people up, help them to stay calm, not feel as much pain. Wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. And we'll see that in the Bible. Like he, he makes wine to make glad the heart of man. So what I don't think this verse is teaching, I don't think it's teaching people to... It's not when it says, hey, give unto him... I didn't include verse 7, I forgot to. Um, give unto them, he'll, he'll drink and remember his misery no more. I don't think what that is teaching is somebody just gets so plastered off their face that they don't even remember what happened last night. What it's saying is, hey... Wine has the ability, or alcohol has the ability to cheer people up, right, if taken in a little bit. And the Bible teaches this, right? So just like it can cheer people up, the people who have heavy hearts, that can help them, right? They can help them cheer them up and, and that sort of thing. So that's what that is saying. That's not saying just, just get, encourage people to get drunk. It's saying, hey, there's this, there is a situation where it's good. But there's also situations where it's bad where it should be abstained from. What are those situations? Well, let me give you a few examples. Number six, one, we have the Nazarite vow. We learned about Samson this morning in Kids Club. The Nazarite vows, when you don't cut your hair, you make a vow unto the Lord, you, know, you don't cut your hair, you don't eat anything of the grape. So it's not only liquor, not only wine, you can't eat vinegar of the grape, juice of the grape, you can't eat grapes, you can't eat raisins. That's the Nazarite vow. So there is a place where alcohol should, and wine and grapes should be completely abstained from, right? So there's one situation. If you're taking a Nazarite vow, and in Samson's case, he was a Nazarite from his birth. What's another example of a situation where you should not consume any alcohol at all? Leviticus 10, it talks about here, and the Lord spake unto Aaron, so Aaron is the father of the priesthood, do not drink wine nor strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So there is a situation where they're not meant to be drinking wine. Now, I believe a lot of the times they were, you know, because when they took of the tithes, part of that tithes was wine and strong drink. But there's a specific scenario, hey, if your duty is now to go into the tabernacle and perform a duty, because obviously the, the, the priesthood and the Levites, they'd be on a roster as well. They're not just 24 hours serving. They'd, be, they'd go to work, their work would be the service of the tabernacle, and then they'd go home and they can relax. They can probably take sick leave and holiday leave and all that sort of stuff. But there's a such situation where they shouldn't. Now, some people use this verse to just show, hey, we're priests and you shouldn't drink it at all. Right? So some people use that verse if you're position one and say, hey, look, this is why kings and priests are told not to drink it. We're kings and priests. But is that what that verse is saying? This verse is not saying they should never drink it. There's this time when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation lest you die. Now why, why is it important that those that go into the tabernacle don't drink wine and strong drink? Well, we, we're given some clues. In Isaiah 28 it says here, But they have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink they are swallowed up of wine. So like notice here, it's condemning drunkenness. They are out of the way through strong drink. Look at this. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Right, so two things there. When, there. when there's a time when you may, you're, you're going to get, you may get a vision from God. Or there are times when you are judging people. Now, this is something that's interesting because, you know, it's saying don't go, don't drink wine or strong drink when you go, when you go into the tabernacle and they err in vision. Because notice here, Zacharias, who was John the Baptist's dad, he was a priest of the order of Aaron, right? So he went in and he did things in the tabernacle. And notice here, when he goes in, as people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple, this is when he was approached by the angel in the tabernacle and told how you're going to have a son and all this sort of stuff. It says, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And look at this. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So notice when he comes out speechless, people already say, hey, Zacharias probably saw a vision in the temple. 
So this is why I believe, hey, there's, the time, there's not a time and place to be drinking any alcohol when you go into the tabernacle because you, you may not fully understand the vision God is about to give you. Because they'd go in, there'd be a vision that they would get. Like Zacharias went in, they, they knew, hey, this is like common, that people go in, they get a vision, they get a revelation from God. They need to share that with the people. God says, hey, that's not the, that's not the time and the place to, be, to have any alcohol at all. So when it comes to judgment in the same way, I believe it's not just all the time priests cannot drink alcohol. There are certain times. There are certain times kings and princes should not drink alcohol. Now, when is that certain time? Well, we, we talked about it in Proverbs 31, where it says, hey, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So what is the danger that they will pervert judgment? Now, is a king always sitting at judgment no just like a judge today a judge today is not always sitting in judgment there is a time when he's off the clock right he's off work right he's having a holiday he's not sitting as a judge and we see this in the bible we see that there is a place where a ruler will sit right and will judge isaiah 5 look woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous, righteousness of the righteous from him. Now, when does that take place? At a judgment seat, right? At a judgment seat, when a judge sits down, he hears a case and he judges. And what is God saying in Proverbs 31? That is when a king and a prince and a judge should not be drinking alcohol because they have to judge righteously. They have to be completely sober, right? So it says here, Exodus 18. Look at what Moses does here. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until evening. So you see Moses sitting. And what is Jethro saying to Moses in Exodus 18? You just can't be sitting here all the, every day. You're going to be wearying yourself. Right? You just can't always be there judging day from day till night. So he gets other people to help take that, that work. But notice here how he is sitting... And the people are standing before him, coming to get judgment. This is the same that happens when the two harlots come to Solomon. Then came there two women that were harlots under the king and stood before him. So the king now also as a judge, just like Moses sat as a judge prior to the time of the kings, when there were kings, they sat in judgment. And that's what Proverbs 31, I believe, is talking about. That's the position two um, um, position. And stood before him. So they come, they stand before the king. He's sitting in judgment. He should not be drinking any alcohol at all. Let's look at other examples of this judgment seat. It's consistent all through the Bible that there is a place and time where they sit down for judgment. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. So that's when Pilate is sitting to judge Jesus and carry out his sentence. Therefore, now this is Paul, this is Festus, now judging Paul from a judgment seat. When they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. You say, Festus, why did you have to do it on the morrow? Why didn't you just judge him as soon as you heard it? Why aren't you just judging all the time? No. Because why is he saying, on the morrow, when he sat on the judgment seat, that's when he judged, Right? So let's see how there's a time and a place when judgment is actually carried out. It's not just all the time. It's not just everyday discernment that it's talking about. It's talking about a ruler actually having to discern and judge between two cases in a judgment seat. And of course, you have the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So that's what I believe Proverbs 31 is talking about. Now let's go on to the qualifications of a bishop. It says here, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. So position one would say, if you drink any at all, you're given to wine, you're disqualified as a bishop. You're disqualified to serve in the ministry. Now when you think yourself, just in the English, to be given to something, when you just do it once, or you just do it every now and then. Are you given to that? So most people would understand rightly that being given to wine means you're a drunkard, that you're, you're taking it in excess, not that you're taking just it moderately. 
So that's how position two would understand this verse and say, well, you're, you're not giving, you're not a drunkard. It's not that you drink it every now and then. Or, um, and then position one would say, well, this is teaching absolute abstinence. Now, the reason why, and, and I'm just showing you here that it's all through the qualifications, not given to wines, the bishop, there's the deacons. But this is where it gets a bit interesting because it's like, this is like not given to wine. And then the deacons, it says, well, it's not given, they're not given to much wine. Now, why there is it, is it emphasizing the word much? Why, why, is it, why is it emphasizing what the wine is when it says much wine? To me, that supports the view that being not, given, being not given to wine means that you're not taking it in excess. You're not given to much wine. But for those that teach complete abstinence, this would be a completely redundant statement. Because if you can't even have a little bit, why, why would I need to tell you that you don't need to be given to a lot? Do you see what I mean? See what I mean? So if, if you believe abstinence, it's like, why is this redundant term here? But if you believe in excess, it makes sense because it's reinforcing that given to wine is given to much wine. Now, not only is it given to the bishops and the deacons, but the older women as well. So it's not given to much wine. It uses the same term as it does for the deacons. Now, an argument I've heard is saying, well, like with the excess of wine and the excess of riot, it's saying you should abstain from it completely because it also says here that you should not be given to filthy lucre. And they say, well, you shouldn't take any part in filthy, you know, you shouldn't have any filthy lucre. So not given doesn't mean that it's not excess filthy lucre. It is, it is um, not being part of it at all, right? Not doing, having it at all. Just like not given to wine. So, so this is the argument, you understand what I'm saying? Not given to wine means abstinence as well. Just like you would abstain from filthy lucre. Now I think when you compare the other passages of the qualifications, it's easy to see what it means to be not being given to filthy lucre. Because when you see in 1 Timothy 3, it says you're not greedy of filthy lucre. Now notice that greed is an excess as well, right? So you're not greedy of filthy lucre. Likewise, the deacons, not double tongue, not given too much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So then the question is, man, does that mean it's okay? To have a little bit of filthy lucre? Well, how do we explain this? Well, I compare it to the parable in Luke 16, when uh, the parable of the unfaithful servant. It says here, look, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Look at this. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the what? Unrighteous mammon. Doesn't that sound like filthy lucre? Who will commit to your trust? the true riches. So when it talks about filthy lucre, what is it about? To me, it's talking about, like in this passage, it's the riches of this world. Now, there is, you partake a little bit in the riches of this world. It's not like, you know, you guys have phones, you've got cars. You know, the question is, are you given to filthy? Are you greedy of filthy lucre? What is that? You're covetous. Just because you have some unrighteous mammon, does not mean that you're given to unrighteous mammon. And it's the same with filthy lucre. Just because you have some filthy lucre doesn't mean you're given to filthy lucre. So I think it can fit, you know, fine with comparing other passages in the Bible. Also, think of it this way. If I told you that I was given to hospitality, but just one time in my life I had somebody over for dinner, would you say, well, oh, man, that felt more. you given, completely given over to hospitality. Like, how much more hospitable can you be? Just by, like, you bought somebody something. You wouldn't say that, right? You would say, no, somebody that's given to hospitality is somebody that has a lifestyle of being hospitable. They're hospitable, they're friendly. Like, you see how, like, it has to... I don't have a problem with people trying to find explanations for these verses, but at least you have to be consistent. It has to, has to fit everywhere. And this is why I take position two, because I find when I look at all the verses in the Bible, it's just like, it just doesn't hold up. You know, given to hospitality, apt to teach. A lover of hospitality, lover of good men. You just do it once, are you a lover of hospitality? You know, if you love just one good man, are you a lover of good men? It's a, so 
I don't, I don't see how it works there. Let's look at some other ones where people use to say, hey, this is teaching complete abstinence. Deuteronomy 29. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And they'll say, look, see, if you abstain from wine and strong drink, you will know God better. Right? That's sort of how it, how it preaches. But is it consistent? First of all, is that what God is even saying in Deuteronomy 29? Is he saying that they never drank wine or strong drink? No, the, the context here is when they were in the wilderness. The 40 years in the wilderness, he's saying, there you didn't drink wine and strong drink. So what is, the, what is the implication to that verse? That's saying when they weren't in the wilderness, they were drinking wine and strong drink. If it was different in the wilderness. But the other thing is, they say, well, you didn't drink wine or strong drink. See, because it's wrong. It's, it's sinful to, to consume wine and strong drink. That's why you're abstaining from it, that you might know the Lord. But then why haven't you applied bread? Does that mean if I abstain? Maybe this is teaching gluten-free. You know, like you're gluten-free, then you'll know God better. You know, gluten is like not good for you. But no, it's because all this is saying is there was this, tempor there was this temporary time where they went to the wood. They didn't have the luxuries that they had when they were in Egypt or when they settled, right? They're going through the wilderness. God fed them with manna, the different bread. And they, had, didn't have, they didn't have vineyards to create wine from and everything like that. So that's what it's saying in Deuteronomy 29. What about Deuteronomy 32? Deuteronomy 32 I want to address as well. So the thought here is, I'll just read it first and I'll tell you the thought and the counter. For their rock is not as our rock, even as our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of their of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. And the thought goes like this. You see there is a comparison between what they have, what they make, and what we make. And you see like our wine is like the fresh, pure blood of the grape, and it's, it's non-alcoholic, but their wine is the alcoholic one. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Poison, like alcohol is poison cruel venom of asps and I say like see the difference in these two substances their wine and our wine now let's just be consistent here right if what this verse is teaching is that there because to me what this is teaching that there is a spiritual truth to this right it's, it's, the analogy is like food and drink but there's a spiritual application that like what they've produced is evil their bad spiritual fruit and our good spiritual fruit but if you draw it, if you only understand it physically and then draw it to its logical end, you'll say, okay, well, let's say what this is teaching is that there is a good physical drink and an evil physical drink. That's what this verse is teaching. It's a good wine and there's a bad one. Well, then let me ask you, is, is there a good vine and a bad vine? Is there a good grape and a bad grape? No, because I thought all grapes are good. New wine's found in the cluster, right? They tread out the new wine. It's all non-alcoholic. So what is making a grape their grape when it's the same grapes, but we're producing two different things, right? Reducing alcoholic, non-alcoholic. So, so why does it only, why is this verse only applied to the end product? But it's not applied to everything else where it says ours and theirs, their vine, their grapes. Are there, are there clusters that are evil now as well? You see what I mean? So it's not being consistent with the verse. That's what I'm saying. Can't use this verse to teach complete abstinence. Like there's an evil drink out there because there's not an evil grape, right? Because they would understand all grapes are fine. So I don't think that's what that verse is saying. If there's a spiritual truth behind this verse, and that's talking about the spiritual fruit, and that's understandable because in the New Testament there's good fruit and there's bad fruit, right? But we're not talking about the physical fruit. It's not, there's not a physical fruit that is sinful to consume and not sinful to consume, right? I bet some farmers might love that. They'd love people to believe like their grape, the Concord grape is fresh and then they, you know, they can put all the other grape farmers out of business. Right? Last one with negatives. I told you it'd be long. We've still got the positive ones to go to. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So people will say... Well, he's not drinking this because it's alcoholic wine and that's why he doesn't want to defile himself. He doesn't want to defile with alcoholic wine. Now, I think this one's pretty easy to debunk because 
obviously he's in a pagan nation amongst Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They are likely, and, and you know, they're not like they were, offering their food and drink to idols. So it doesn't just, it's not just about the, the, yeah, the food was sacrificed to idols, so he didn't drink the food, but the drink was alcoholic. That's why he didn't drink it. No, because they offered drinks to idols as well. They offered food and drink. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 10, when it says, hey, the Gentiles, what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. I don't want you to have any fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. So you see how they're, they're not only offering food to false gods, they're offering drink as well. So you can easily understand Daniel to say, well, I don't want to partake in your food and drink that is offered to idols. And that's why 1 Corinthians 10 ends uh, with, what, with where, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So what was Daniel practicing in Daniel? He's trying to give all glory to God, even in his meat and drink. That is the lesson there. Not that necessarily it was alcoholic wine. Now let's try and get through the positive verses because I think this really rounds it out. This is why I want to preach it in the one sermon because when I think you only listen to the negative verses, I think when you look at the positive verses, it really, I think, just takes that position one away because I think there are a lot of verses in here that it's hard to get around the fact that this is talking about an alcoholic beverage. Psalm 104, verse 14 and 15. He causes the grass to grow... For the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengtheneth man's heart now remember that the argument is really around whether or not the bible condemns all consumption of alcohol so there's an argument there as we look through the negative verse you can say oh, i can see how they can see it that way i can see how they can see it this way but there is an answer to say, hey, look, this is not just condemning outright consumption at all. Now, the argument on the positive side is not really about whether wine is always fermented or not, because I don't have a problem with unfermented wine. I don't have a problem with the Bible's including unfermented wine when saying, hey, God is blessing this and, you know, we can enjoy this and all that. Even, you know, as people say, They'll say like, yeah, don't you know when you have like a really good glass of juice, that can make you merry, that can make your heart glad. So they can say like, hey, it's like, this, this fits, there's nothing wrong with this verse when it comes to alcohol versus non-alcohol. But when you start looking at how this phrase is used in the Bible, that's where I think it starts to unravel. See, it says wine, notice that, it makes glad the heart of man. Now look at Ecclesiastes 10. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. So it's recognized in the Bible that wine makes people happy. Now, if you take position two, you can understand. Like, hey, uh, just like caffeine can calm people, wine can make people a little bit happy. Well, alcohol can make people a little bit happy. Well, they say, like, no, 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 this is only talking about juice. The juice is just what maybe people just are rejoicing because they have this fresh juice to drink. Well, let's keep going. Zechariah 10, 7. They of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. So again, you can fit both. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. Isaiah 24. The new wine mourneth, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted do sigh. Now, first of all, you think, I thought new wine was not alcoholic wine, because it's new. New wine's found in the cluster. They tread out new wine. Why would the merry-hearted, you know, be associated with new wine? And you say, well, it's, there you go, it's juice. Well, let's keep going. Esther 1. So no notice this phrase, being merry with wine. What does it mean? On the seventh day. So this is now talking about unbelievers, like an Esther. Esther's in captivity, right? And this is like uh, the, the Persian Empire. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. So you say, well, is he just drinking juice? And just really glad that he's like drinking and enjoying this fresh juice? See, this is where it's like, well, it's an unbeliever it's using the same phrase. I mean, I'm thinking, okay, it's, I don't think it's just juice anymore. First Samuel 25, Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king, 
And Nabal's heart was merry within him. Look at this. For he was very drunken. So notice, he is drinking in excess, but notice how it describes the effect of that drink. It's making your heart merry. Right? So when it talks about wine that maketh glad the heart of man, is it more reasonable for me to believe, hey, that's just somebody really enjoying a nice, fresh, cold glass of juice? Or is it that they're, they're starting to feel the effects that alcohol imparts onto somebody like similar like with coffee, right? Like people drink coffee in Algeria. It's like it makes them happy. Well, here, you know it's alcoholic wine that Nabal is drinking. Now, Absalom. So you can see here, had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now when Abnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, smite Abnon, and then kill him, fear not, have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. So what is it about this wine that would make Amnon more susceptible to be killed? Right? So you see how this is not just talking about juice. This phrase is referring to the effect that wine has on people. Now you can say, oh, I could still be juice. But then the question is, it's like with the wine. You have like two different wines. It's like, do, well, do I have two different ways to understand heart is merry? Is, is, is there one way, heart is merry for good wine, which is just, just makes you happy, and then there's wine that maketh your heart merry for the way alcohol affects it. So now it's like not even you have two wines, now you have two ways you understand merry with wine. Right? So it's like, is there always just, it just always keeps splitting. Right? So it's not that it just always means the same thing consistently through Scripture. You can't just compare Scripture with Scripture and get an idea of what this phrase means. Now it's, you have two wines, you also have two different effects of the phrase merry with wine, because you have the effect of juice and you have the effect of wine. That's how they would have to understand it. Now let's go on to places where it seems that strong wine, strong drink, wine is being encouraged to drink, and how position one and position two would understand it. Numbers 28, and the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hymn for the one lamb in the holy place, shall thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. Now this Numbers 28 is talking about the daily morning and evening sacrifice. So part of that morning and evening sacrifice is that they would also offer a drink offering. And that drink offering here is saying it's strong wine. Now strong drink and strong wine in the Bible has always, as I have learned, meant alcoholic drink. Like you may be able to say wine is juice and, and, and unferment, uh, juice and fermented juice and wine, but people say like, well, strong is normally referring to st like strong drink. It's a strong alcoholic drink. But because they have to take this abstinence view, now the way they understand verses like this is just, it's just maybe a very concentrated wine or it's like a spiced wine, but it's not alcoholic. Right? Because not only do they say, well, you shouldn't be drinking it, but you shouldn't even be looking at it. So how are they pouring out this strong wine? But... You know, this is saying, it's not just non-alcoholic wine that's being offered, it's strong wine that's being offered and being offered to God. Deuteronomy 14, when it talks about the tithe, bringing your tithe. If you don't have, you can't bring it all the way with you. You can convert it into money. Bring the money with you. And this is something that's interesting. You have to understand in the Bible, like offerings are not just discarded. They're not just given and discarded in the Bible. The priests and the Levites oftentimes take part in those offerings. So you, the thing is, if you think, like, okay, well, maybe people who have this strong drink or this strong wine and they're never consuming it, but, I mean, they're making it and always having it with them, and the Bible's saying, hey, you shouldn't really have it around. If you believe that, you shouldn't really have it around and have it with you, but, yeah, you can travel with it, you can have it around the house, you can, you know, you take it for an offering. The one thing you can't do is drink it. You know, to me, it's just a little unreasonable now because it's just part of the offerings that are given, right? And part of the offerings that are given is this strong drink and strong wine. So anyways, with the tithe, you, you convert it to money, you bring your money, you then buy, it says here, thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep or for wine, or for strong drink, for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So notice that offerings of food and drink are not just given to just be, you know, poured out and discarded or burnt. Oftentimes they would partake of those offerings. They'd bring in their tithes, and that would be what the Levites and the priests consume. So how does position one understand these verses? Well, they will have to 
say, well, in these verses, these positive mentions, they're always non-alcoholic. So here, when you're saying, hey, buy whatever your soul desires, wine and strong drink, that's a non-alcoholic wine. But then they also have to change, you know, they also have to come up with another explanation for why strong drink is encouraged to drink. And they'll have to say, well, there's not only two types of wine, there's also two types of strong drink. And that could be concentrated drinks, heavily spiced drinks, drinks that, you know, like, like vinegar could be like a strong drink, but it may not have any more alcohol in it. So it's not unreasonable. I'm just saying like that's how they would have to explain these sorts of verses. So Deuteronomy 14, we would say, well, there's no problem with it. It's just, this is God saying, well, you can, you can enjoy those things. He's not condoning drunkenness. It's just saying, like, hey, it's not necessarily wrong to consume. Let's look at some other verses where he kind of makes you scratch your head a bit. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine? and the smell of thine ointment than all spices. Now notice that wine is being compared with that feeling you get when you sleep with the opposite gender, right? when husband and wife sleep together. Now, if you think, is it reasonable for somebody to think like, man, like sleeping with my wife is just like, it's just like getting like a really good glass of juice, you know? Or does it make more sense? Like, if you think about when you, I mean, think about what goes on when couples sleep together. Like, you know, the, 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 the hormones are running. It's, it's, people say it's like almost intoxicating. You know, it's, you know, people get addicted to pornography and, you know, um, harlots and all that sort of stuff. So it makes sense to you that that act would be likened to something intoxicating. But no, because this is a positive mention of wine. So it's like, is, it, is, it, is love being compared to juice or is love being compared to something that has the ability to overcome, right? Has the ability to become intoxicated. I think, you know, that's, that's, what do you think? <laughs> Luke 10, let's see here. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was uh, when he saw him. He had compassion on him. So this is the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So some people would say, well, why would you treat a wound with juice? We say, you wouldn't treat it with juice. That probably makes it worse, right? Because bad bacteria like feeds on sugar. Ch chances are you're putting wine, like strong wine on it to disinfect it. And I think, I, I've even seen in movies in the past, you know, somebody gets shot and they get out the brandy and they're like, oh, they disinfect the wound. So that would make sense. But if you believe position one, then it's like, well, he had wine, but he's just using it for medicinal purposes. He just had it with him, just like you may have, like, you know, uh, like alcohol to, like, clean or to disinfect. You're not drinking it, saying, well, this good Samaritan just had wine on him for medical reasons, not for drinking reasons. So that, that's sort of how they would see those two verses. So uh, that's another one where there's two different explanations. What about 1 Timothy 5? Drink no longer water but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities how would the two positions view this well one would say and this is where i find it inconsistent right like you know i think the consistent view of position one would be you know you believe that you know pasteurized wine and boiled down wine watered again somehow like it has still its medical antioxidant properties and maybe it's not as, you know, it would have to be like pasteurized wine because, you know, obviously if there's a problem with the water, you're not going to add that water back into to dilute the wine and drink it unless they think it, it, it sterilizes the water somehow. So they kind of come up with this theory to say like, no, it's not alcoholic wine that he's drinking. It's, it's just pasteurized juice or it's boiled down juice that's watered again that he can drink. Now, if that's the case, then my question would be, well, why is Paul saying just drink a little bit of it? Like, you don't tell somebody, okay, don't drink wine, just make sure you drink a little bit of juice, a little bit of watered down, you know, uh, for, uh, concentrate. I mean, there's no danger in drinking. Like, if you're sick, then drink 500 mils of juice. I mean, that's like a... But if you drink 500 mils of wine, now you're going to be drunken. So it makes sense that he says, hey, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. But he's saying little because he knows there's alcohol in the wine. You shouldn't be a drunken. But if you take position one, then it's like, okay, well, you think, okay, maybe it's juice, and juice is good for you, but then why, why only a little bit? So, I don't know. 
Genesis 49. This is a verse that I was often used to show, you know, because one of the main arguments to say, oh, you know, well, wine, and see, I don't really have a problem with wine also referring to non-fermented drinks, but one, mainly the way they argue that wine must be non-fermented drinks is because you can see wine being referred to as the juice that's inside the grape. So here is one in Genesis 49, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is called unto the choice wine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So you can see here that wine doesn't necessarily mean fermented grapes. This is position one. It's just the, the juice that comes from grapes. But then what's interesting is in verse 12, remember how we read Proverbs 23, and it says, who hath wounds without cause? Who hath babbling? Who hath, um, it says, redness of eyes? Then it says here, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So then like, I don't really understand this passage, but I'm just thinking, okay, I know this has been used to say that wine is non-alcoholic here, but then why in verse 12 is the wine making his eyes red if it's not alcoholic? Sounds like it's alcoholic wine there, but um, they use verse 11. Um, I've never heard them read on to verse 12, so maybe that's why. Um, Deuteronomy 11. Here's another reasoning there. So it's like, that I will give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain. So this is talking about gathering in the stuff from the field. It says, thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And they say, see, look, see, when you gather in your crop, you're not gathering in wine. They say, well, you're gathering in grapes. So they see, like, you see how they'll say, see, wine is just a synonymous term for grapes. And that's how they say, see, it's not that it, the wine is alcoholic wine. It's that you can even prove, like, look, if gather, the wine is actually referring to the grapes. Now, if, if that's the case, are we going to start calling olives oil? Are we going to start calling wheat corn? You know, we can see here that this, this is something, like, if you don't know what, this is not actually talking about, like, corn on a cob. Corn in the Bible is just grain, right? So when you, have, when you, when you gather in the corn, they're gathering the grain. But you know where, if you look up wheat harvest, harvesting, do you know you're not actually gathering in grain per se? Because what you have to do is you have to like cut the wheat. Then you have to, you know the song, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in, because you cut the wheat, which is like the, the grains on it. Then you have to like gather up the sheaves. Then they have to like tie the sheaves and then they have to like dry the sheaves. And then they thresh the wheat to get the grain off. So you see how there's a process of obtaining what wheat gives you. Just like there is a process that gives you oil. You know, crushing the olives and getting out the oil, just like there is a process of getting out the wine. Now they might say, yeah, well that doesn't necessarily mean it's alcoholic. That's because you press out, you get juice, you get fresh juice. So it's like, okay, well, but you can see that the words here are not an, a word synonymous with what you're gathering. You're gathering something else and processing it into something else. So what, why is it so unreasonable to think yeah, well, obviously, that new wine, if it's put in bottles, is going to ferment into wine. So it can be both new wine and old wine that you're gathering in. It's not calling the grape wine. It's saying you're gathering in what you're going to produce from those things. You're, you're going to produce corn, wine, and oil. But what do you gather? Wheat, grapes, and olives. Right? So that's Deuteronomy 11. Now... I'm not, I'm not denying the fact, like I, I'm, I'm fine with, like I said, wine being referred to either. And I'm not even denying the fact, like did people drink fresh fruit juice? Yeah, they probably did. You know, they probably, you know, they're, they're crushing it and they're everything and they just take some and they drink it too and their heart is merry as well. So I'm not, I'm not denying the fact that people drink fresh juice. I'm not even denying the fact that there is a way to preserve juice without being alcoholic. Because, you know, like we have Welch's grape juice today. We have, you can get grape juice from Kirkland's grape juice from Costco. There's a way that people can pasteurize it, boil it down and preserve it. The question is, the question really is, is that all they did? Right? Is that, is that is, you, know, whilst, you know, just because they had ways of preserving it, was that the common practice? Is that what everyone did? Is that something we actually see being done in the Bible. Now this idea of boiling down the wine and then watering it again, I've heard the argument from 1 Samuel 25 
where this is why Abigail, when she goes to meet King David, she goes and, you know, because Nabal's like made King David angry. So Abigail goes to King David in sort of like a peace offering and sort of, hey, here's something for your troops and everything. So I've heard the argument here that Abigail, when she takes, she takes all this food. So look at this, 200 loaves of wine, five sheep and all this food. But it's like, why did she only take two bottles of wine? So you say, ah, oh, so here's an example where this wine was the concentrate. So she could take two bottles and could feed this troop, this army troop. That's, that's, that's one theory, right? And, and if that's the case, I'm not saying, that doesn't necessarily debunk my view because I don't, I don't have a problem with people technically having other ways of preserving things. My position is, that's just, I just don't believe that's all they did. They just they didn't drink only pasteurized or concentrated wine. Because you could also say, well, why? Because let's say she brought 200 bottles of wine. Should she be doing that? Should she be giving that much wine to, to a troop that is going to battle? Remember what happened to Amnon? How did, how did they let his guard down and kill him when his heart was merry with wine? So that could be another theory that, you know, maybe she's just not bringing them a lot of wine because she's just bringing to them as a treat because she doesn't want to encourage any of them to get drunk, right? Because if they get drunk, then they're not going to be effective in battle. And it could be actually seen as a, you know, she wants to bring them some wine, but if she just brings them like barrels of wine, David might be thinking like, you know, are you, are you trying to like let, get our guard down so that we can be defeated, you know? So uh, that's another theory as well. But notice, like, you know, the Bible's not 100% clear, but people have theories of how they explain these based on their positions. Now let's go to Isaiah 1. Just this idea of, some people say, like, well, they never drank wine straight, they watered it down, or they concentrated, they mixed it with water. I found this verse interesting in Isaiah 1, verse 21, when God talks about the judgments on God's people. He says, how is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it but now murderers thy silver is become dross look at this thy wine mixed with water so if they are just drinking wine with water all the time i mean the bible's describing that as part of the curses of god part of the judgment of god that they would always have to be drinking watered down wine so um i thought that verse was interesting on that thought now let's look at new wine in the cluster isaiah 65 Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Now, I think it's pretty clear that new wine in the Bible can be alcoholic as well. But they say, well, this new wine is not alcoholic, because look, it's found in the cluster, it's inside the grape. How, like, that's not scientifically possible for juice inside of a grape to already start fermenting and have traces of alcohol. Did you know that that's not true? Do you know, do you know look up, I looked it up, there's something called carbonic maceration. And do you know what carbonic maceration is? Carbonic maceration is when the fruit starts to ferment when it's not even crushed yet. It's fermenting inside the fruit. And you know there are wine regions in France that use this method because because what happens is if the grapes are in like a carbon dioxide rich environment, the grape itself will start fermenting because it's no longer on the vine anymore. So this is the clusters, right? So the clusters are put into the barrel. Sometimes it already starts naturally because at the bottom of the barrel, it's already starting slightly to ferment and now it's a carbon dioxide rich environment and it starts to ferment inside the grape. Or if, you know, when you put all the grapes inside the barrel, some of the bottom ones are already crushed. That wine starts fermenting, so it creates carbon dioxide at the bottom of the barrel and so on and so forth. But some winemakers actually pump carbon dioxide into barrels to create that effect because it creates a different taste to the wine. So my point is, well, it is scientifically possible to ferment the wine, the, the juice that is inside of a grape. And they know that once it reaches about 1% to 2%, then the skin can't hold it anymore. That's when they finally burst, right? And, and they will ferment normally. So you can, you know I mean, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what this verse is saying, but to say that it's impossible for wine inside of a, a grape to be fermented is not actually true. Uh, Proverbs 3, so shall thou, thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And then they'll say, look, when you press out the wine, 
when you press out the grapes, sorry, you're not getting alcoholic wine because when you press it out, it's not fermented yet, and we already talked about carbonic maceration, but so you press it out, you say, like, how can that stuff be wine? That stuff must be non-alcoholic juice. Yeah, well, maybe if today, like, you're using, like, a modern juicer that just, like, instantly separates the pulp from the juice, and then you just get non-alcoholic juice, like, with an instant. But think about in the days of ancient Israel. How do they actually tread these out? I mean, have you ever watched a video of people treading out wine? It's not like it's, it's, not like it's exactly a quick process. I mean, they're treading it out for ages. I mean, that stuff is already starting to ferment as they crush it out, and they're mixing all the yeast and everything within the wine. And that's why to me it makes sense that when after they've treaded the wine and we can see in the bible this is how they did it right so it's not that you know so some people believe that people didn't actually tread out wine no they did because we see in the bible why are they called the treaders of wine if they're not actually treading out the wine so they're treading out the wine and then what does the press do the press is like how they press out the rest of the pulp that's remaining because the excess will run off but then all the stuff that's left in the pulp that's already starting to ferment, like it ferments immediately, right? And within the first couple of days, that's the first ferment where it's very active, right? And that's why they, they leave it without the lid off. Then the wine press is crushed, then to separate the remaining juice from the pulp. So the question is, when it says, thy presses shall burst out with new wine, is it so unreasonable? To believe that that's actually fermented that's already starting to ferment as it comes out of the presses is it completely non-alcoholic like to me that that's unreasonable it's unreasonable in that day and age when they're slowly pressing it out to guarantee that what's coming out is not has no alcohol in it at all and we see the method here of treading out of wine isaiah 16 verse 10 gladness is taken away and joy out of the plentiful field and in the vineyards there shall be no singing Neither sh shall there be shouting. I just want you to note there, because I'm going to come back to that. Neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I've made their vintage shouting to cease. So you see here, they're treading out the wine, they're shouting. It was a time of joy as they're treading out this wine. Joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab, and I've caused wine to fail from the wine presses. None shall tread with shouting. Their shouting shall be no shouting. So notice, I just want you to note there that as they tread, the shouting going on. Because I'll come back to that. Now I think in the Bible it's quite easy to show that new wine can easily be alcoholic as well. Now Acts 2 is one of them, but it's not the only one. Acts 2 is when on the day of Pentecost they go out and preach and they're preaching in different languages and they're being accused by the Jews. They, they're saying, well, what mean is this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Now, is that just them speaking in ignorance? No, because Peter, he understands that when they accuse them of being full with new wine, Peter says, hey, these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. So Peter understood that new wine can be intoxicating, and they understood that new wine can be intoxicating. So it's quite clear in the Bible that new wine does contain some level of alcohol. But look at some other verses. Hosea 4. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. So how can wine and new wine take away the heart? New wine is meant to be the stuff that comes out of presses. It's not alcoholic. So new wine also has the capability to take away the heart. Isaiah 49, look at this one. See, this, that's what I say. When you look up the word wine in the Bible, you'll find things you'll be like, well, this is really interesting. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. Look at this. As with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Saviour and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Why is it sweet wine? It's not all fermented yet. Now, if you say, well, the sweet wine is not alcoholic, why is it, why is it saying you're drunken with one as with sweet wine? Because even sweet wine, wine that hasn't been fully fermented, still has alcohol, right? And you can be drunken with it. You know, that's how they, people make port. They, they don't always, that's the difference between a sweet wine and a dry wine. They say it's dry because all the sugar's been fermented. But if they stop the fermentation, it can be a sweet wine. That doesn't mean it doesn't have alcohol in it. Joel 1, awake ye drunkards and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now, the, the, the passage I think is the most clear and I think the hardest to get over that new wine is alcoholic and that the practice of creating alcoholic wine was just commonplace 
in Israel is the parable of the new wine and the new bottles. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 5. It's in the other two Gospels as well. I don't go, won't go to them for sake of time. But Luke 5, verse 36. Look at this. No, and he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And look at this. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Now think about this passage, right? Now, when Jesus gives a parable, and he gives like an analogy and things to help people to understand spiritual things, does it make sense for him to use something that people have no idea about? That doesn't make sense. You know, it's like, you know, I don't want to give some crude example, but it's, it's, it's sort of like, think about this. It's like, it's, like say, it's like saying, like, he's saying, hey, you know how like when the drunkards make their wine and they put it into new bottles and the bottles burst, they put it into old wine? But the people are saying, like, is, is, is Jesus trying to like trip us up? Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. I've never pressed out, I've never put new wine in new bottles. I always pasteurize my wine. It never it never bursts the bottles. So how would he know what they're talking about? They know what he's talking about because it's common. Just like it's so common for somebody to fix clothing. Right? This is a common thing. It's like, hey, just like people fix clothes and they don't use an old new garment for an old garment. People put their new wine into new, bo new bottles. If they put it into an old bottle, it's going to burst. Why? Because of the fermentation process. Now, to me, that's pretty obvious that Jesus has no... and, and recognises that's just what people do. They put new wine into new bottles and it's fermented. But I've heard theories... This is how position one may... I've heard, this is how I've heard theories about what they do. Because to them, no, all wine is pasteurised or boiled down. So what they say is, no, the reason why you put new wine into a new bottle is because an old bottle may contain like residue of like, you know, alcoholic wine. So then that could then contaminate your pasteurized wine and then make the bottle to burst. Right? So that's how they would sort of say. But then the question is, if all you ever stored is pasteurized and boiled down wine, like where's the live yeast coming from, from the old bottle? Are you taking old bottles from, from their wine and the poison of ass and taking their old bottles and then putting your new wine into it? And then why would anyone ever say, if you've drunk old wine, straightway desireth new? Because if all you've been drinking is just concentrate, like who, who prefers concentrate juice over fresh juice? Nobody. Right, so as soon as you drink the new wine, you're not going to say, you know what, I prefer the concentrate, actually. I prefer the stuff that's been stored and pasteurized down. No, but but if, it's, if it's fermented wine, then you can understand because, you know, the flavors come, different flavors come out. All the time, you know, all the, the winos do that, you know. So you can understand when somebody's drunk old wine, they don't straightway desire a new wine because the flavors are not as produced. It's not, it doesn't taste the same. So I don't know how you get around this one, but to me it's pretty clear that that, is the standard practice of the Israelites. But even, like, I'll show you a couple other verses as well. Like, this, this is where I just, the nail in the coffin. Jeremiah 13. Therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they shall say unto thee, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Then shalt thou say unto them, So isn't that no new wine into new bottle? Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne and the priests and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. So you see here, there, God himself using the analogy of putting wine. So Jesus is saying, no wine, no man put new wine into new bottles. But you could say, oh yeah, but that's Jesus just using something that people, that not, not the good people did, like it's the drunkards did which I think is already unreasonable. But you can say, well, Jesus never did it. Yeah, maybe they did it because he knew that they were sinful. But here you see God himself using the analogy for himself, like, I'm going to fill bottles. And he's, and he's using that as a spiritual example. It's he's filling them with drunkenness. But then you ask, them, what's the question? Because, and this is why this gives us insight into what the new wine and new bottles actually means. Like the new wine is like his spirit, right? And if you put it into somebody that's not saved, they're going to get judged and condemned. 
You put it into a new bottle, both are preserved, right? So that's why when we receive the Spirit of God, we like the new wine that's preserved. But there's nothing wrong with the wine in and of itself. So it just shows here that even in God's analogy in Jeremiah 13, he is referring to filling these bottles with wine that contains alcohol. I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but destroy them. So it's interesting because this is where I think, you know, when the Bible says God shall send them strong delusion, you know, I think that's tied in with this idea that prior to judging the world, he's providing them with something that they can intoxicate themselves on. So it's like here, like, you know, God sends them strong delusion. He doesn't force them to believe it. So I'm not saying here that God is condoning drunkenness. I'm saying God provides, you know, like enough rope for them to hang themselves. It's like here with the strong delusion. He provides them with the rope and then they believe the lie that they might all be damned that believe not the truth. So it's the same. He can give a wicked person alcohol. He knows that they're going to overconsume and then just, you know, he's not necessarily condoning drunkenness. He just knows the wickedness of their heart. John 2, let's touch on this one just briefly. When the rule, this is when Jesus made the water wine. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants withdrew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, if it's okay to drink wine in moderation or alcohol in moderation, there's no problem with Jesus creating alcoholic wine. Did he not create alcohol? See, to me, it's a bit hard for me to accept that the ruler of the feast or the governor of the feast, when he drank it, couldn't tell the difference between either pasteurized or fresh juice and wine, right? I think they would know. Some theories I've heard, well, maybe Jesus made non-alcoholic wine that just tasted better than fermented wine. You know, that's, that's one theory. Um, you know, some people will say, well, how could Jesus be giving alcoholic wine to these people that are already drunk? But that's, that's not the case. The Bible is just saying here that they've well drunk. It's not saying that they are drunk. So it's just that they've had enough to drink and Jesus has provided them more. But just because Jesus, prov just because Jesus provides wine to them, that doesn't necessarily mean he's telling them to drink it all now. You know, it's just that he's provided them with wine. That doesn't necessarily mean he's condoning them abusing the use of wine and drinking in excess and getting drunk. Not only are they not drunk, and maybe, you know, we don't know back then, maybe when people actually had some integrity back then, they would go to a feast and they would not drink themselves silly, right? They just have a little bit. They're well drunk and there's still some more so they can treat themselves to another drink because there's, now there's a bit more for people to share. The other theory I've heard with this is, well, the way position one would explain it is, well, they always drank, uh, you know, fresh juice and, you know, what they were probably drinking was concentrate so the reason why the governor says, hey, you've left the best wine till now is because they said first they would drink all the fresh juice, then they would get into the concentrate, which is kind of like the not so good stuff. And then when more fresh juice came out, that when Jesus made, ah, you've left the good wine until now. So that's another theory I've heard that fits to the abstinence view. But I think, like I said, I, I, I don't think this is necessarily debunking. It's not Jesus just condoning drunkenness, giving drunk people more alcohol. They're just well drunk. Now here's one in Isaiah 25. When you say, well, Jesus will drink wine? Jesus drank wine? I haven't included the one where people accuse him of being a, a glutton and a wine bibber. But, you know, that's interesting as well. Like, why would people accuse Jesus of being a wine bibber when all he drank was pasteurized juice? All he drank was fresh juice? I mean, you don't accuse somebody of being a drunkard when all they drink is Coke all the time. All they drink is juice. So th that as well, I think favors more towards position two but look here in isaiah 25 in this mountain this is talking about prophetically jesus will one day prepare us prepare us prepare us a feast and we will sit and we will eat and we will drink with him what is what are we drinking with him make unto all people a feast of fat things a feast of wines on the lees of fat things full of marrow of wine on the lees well refined now if you know anything about wine you know that the lees uh, that is that sediment that settles when a wine is being stored and, and fermenting and that's the stuff that you'd, you don't drink. And what that lees actually is in a wine, it's the dead yeast that's been fully consumed and all that sort of stuff. And the Bible uses the phrase being settled on your lees because it uses that phrase to describe Christians that are, you know, people that are stagnant. 
right? It's like you being saved, and if you're saved, you've got new wine in this new bottle. But God is saying, like, you as a new wine in a new bottle ought to get stirred up every now and then. Your, your lees shouldn't settle because you've just been stagnant in the Christian life. But here we see here that, you know, is, it, is this teaching that we will drink wine fermented in the new kingdom with Jesus? That's what a lot of people believe. But the position one would say, I mean, I don't know, I've never heard them explain this one, but they might just say, well, you know, pasteurized wine and concentrate wine also has like that dregs at the bottom and the lees. So that's, you know, it's not wine. And we're just drinking like this fresh juice because fresh juice has sediment as well. So it could be that, but, you know, the common usage of the word lees is, is re referred to wine. Now, this is my last section. So I'm, I am coming to an end, guys. I, I hope it's been interesting for you. I know it's been long. But I think uh, it's good to have both sides, I think, in the one sitting so that you can see everything. This is, this is a really interesting point. And this is kind of like, I was like, whoa, man, this, I don't really know what to think of this when I sort of was studying this out. Now, do you, do you know, like, God uses an analogy that he is actually sitting with a, with a cup of wine in his hand. Now, look at this, Psalm 75. For in the, cup, in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup. And the wine is red. So when I, when I was studying this out, I think, okay, in Proverbs 23, when it says, look not on the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup, moveth itself aright. I think that is talking to the fermentation process. It is talking about, you know, it's, when it's red, it's taken the, the, you know, from the, the tannins and moving itself aright, it's just fermenting. But, and you know, it says, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup. Now, if this is talking about somebody who's not a drunkard, not even looking at it at all, why does God, why does God in his analogy, have a cup of wine that is red in his hand? I mean, is he like this? Do you know what I mean? Like he's not looking at it? So he pours out the same, but the dregs there, so the dregs are like lees. All the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. So God has a cup of wine in his hand. And by the analogy, it's an, it's an alcohol. Because this is the only other time it talks about wine being red. Proverbs 23 in here. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me. This is where it gets interesting. This is Jeremiah 25. So this is an analogy that God uses. Because you know in the Old Testament prophets, God uses a lot of analogies of things that he talks through the Bible to himself to help people understand how spiritual things operate. But, but he applies things to himself that are not wrong. Because right? he's not going to say, I'm doing this like this in the real world. It's necessarily something wrong. Look at this. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink. So we know that God has a cup of wine in his hand. And he's, he's t now he's telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you're going to take this cup of wine from my hand, and you're going to go to all the nations and tell them to drink. Now, I know that this is an analogy to illustrate spiritual things, but the analogy itself would not be applied to God if it's something wrong for God to do. And cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it, and they shall drink, look at this, and be moved and be mad. So in the King James Bible, that doesn't mean you're angry. That means they're going crazy, right? Because they're getting drunk. Because of the sword that I will send among them. Then Jeremiah says, Then took I the cup of the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord hath sent me. And then I'll skip down a bit because it just lists all the different nations that he goes to to give this wine to drink. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup of thine hand to drink, then thou shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, Look at it, The Lord shall roar. Now what is this roar in regards to? 
from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. So think about this. You know, I know people have their theories about how they preserve wine and everything. And, you know, maybe the Romans preserved a wine a certain way. I'm not saying the Israelites never did that. But don't you think it's wise, if we want to know what the Israelites did when they dealt with wine, that we look in the Bible for clues about, hey, this is what they did with wine. And we have Jesus not only say, hey, look, no man puts new wine into new bottles because the new bottles burst. And then we have God himself using that same common practice of, you know, like you guys fill bottles, I'm going to fill the inhabitants of the earth and they're going to burst because they're in old bottles. They're going to be judged. And even here, God using the analogy of like, hey, he is saying, hey, like I tread out the grapes in my wrath, right? And have the cup of this indignation and give the nations to drink. How are people meant to understand this if they have not, if this is not their practice? If what they did was always just pasteurize one, I don't know. But it definitely, when you think about these analogies and how God applies them to himself and how Jesus sort of teaches them, it kind of makes you think differently about these passages, right? Like, so Proverbs 23, like, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. Obviously, it's talking about somebody that's a drunkard because God can't describe himself as having a cup of wine that's red right in front of me, in his hand. But also, if you think about Proverbs 31, have you ever thought about I was like saying, oh, man, it gives me some more insight into this verse. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. And God is saying, God's not condoning drunkenness, but he's saying, hey, here's some, they're going to get drunk. But also, he says, even if they refuse to drink, they will drink because they know they're about to perish. That's what I think Jeremiah 25 is saying. So isn't that interesting that even like this passage in, in Proverbs 31, 6 is being applied where people are being given alcohol to drink that are ready to perish. They're going to be judged. So it gives you a bit of different insight into Revelation 14. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So now you understand it's this cup that's in his hand. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. All right, I'm at the end. So I haven't included all verses, but I think today should provide you with enough information that you'll be able to discern the answer for the rest of the ones I've mentioned. Um, so there's two positions, right? I, I believe position two not only explains the Bible verses better, but I think it's actually the process in which the Bible describes, which is treading out the wine, putting it into new bottles, and that being an alcoholic wine. Um, so I think position one sort of requires a lot of theories that I would consider unreasonable, not immediately obvious, and it struggles to fit all the verses consistently. So I think it's important, the reason why I'm preaching on this is because I think it's just important that we have biblical positions on matters of conviction. So I want to be very clear, guys. I am not promoting drunkenness. I'm not saying it's okay for you to be drunk. What I'm saying is that there is an amount of alcohol that can be consumed that does not make a person drunk, does not make a person in sin. I'm not even saying you have to drink alcohol. You know, if you don't want to drink it because that's your conviction, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just believe it's unbiblical to condemn and rail on those who allow alcohol consumption, especially when you drink it yourself. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, your word. Thank you that um, some topics that in the past, Lord, people have just told me are so insignificant. Oh, you know, why preach on these? But they become, you know, these issues become issues of contention, Lord. I just pray, uh, Lord, that, you know, you give us wisdom and uh, help us, Lord, to have your word guide our convictions. And we just pray, Lord, that, um, you know, this sermon will be used greatly for people to help understand the topic more. And um, just thank you, Lord, for your word and um, pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom in every area of life. Help, Lord, this sermon not to be used to promote drunkenness, to pr pr promote, you know, lasciviousness and, and, you know, reveling and banqueting lifestyles, Lord. I just pray that people use wisdom um, in how they uh, live their life. Whatsoever you eat and drink, Lord, help us to do all to the glory of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.